If you will remain standing, our scripture reading comes from the gospel according to Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 24. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. And so he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us go to God in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this time together and we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds that the words that are about to be spoken be your words for your people that bring us into better relationship with you and a better understanding of what it means to be your people. We pray all this in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. Last week we started this brand new sermon series of looking at what it means when we say that we are a new creation what the Holy Spirit does within us when He recreates us. When we accept Jesus into our lives, we have to accept this one honestly painful truth. When He is finished with us, we will not look the same. There is not a single piece of us that will be left. He will have changed the entirety of our being so that we can be like Him. Now, every time we allow God to go a little bit deeper into ourselves, I think every single person in here can accept the fact that they've seen this happen. Every time they allow the Holy Spirit or God to go a little bit further into us, we get a little more changed. And things that we didn't think needed to be changed got changed as well. You know, so many times when we talk about the new creation that we're supposed to become, we focus on our faults and our failures, the things that we already know we're not really all that great on. But God doesn't want just a decent new creation or even a good new creation. He wants a perfect creation. I think um, one of the great theologians, modern theologians of our day is C.S. Lewis, and he put it so perfectly in his book. He says this is why Jesus warned people to count the cost before they became Christians. Because to C.S. Lewis, he said that Jesus said, tells us, make no mistake, if you let me in, I will make you perfect. The moment you put yourself in my hands, that is what you are in for. Nothing less or other than that. You have free will and you can choose to push me away but if you don't understand that i am going to see this job through whatever suffering it may cost you in this earthly life whatever inconceivable purification it may cost you after death and whatever it costs me i will never rest nor let you rest until you are literally perfect until my father can say without reservation that he is as pleased with you as he said he was with me. This I can do and will do. 
but I will do nothing less. This is what we talk about when we say we want to be new creations. This is what we're saying. We want to be made perfect. That's a hard thing to, te- to say because we all really kind of like a lot of par- pieces of ourselves and not all of those things that we love about ourselves is perfect. But Jesus says, if you let me in, I will make you perfect. It's hard for us to understand because so many times when we ask Jesus in, we see what we think needs to be changed and all of a sudden he starts changing things that we didn't think needed to be changed. But the thing is, is that Christianity, our living in to Christ and following Him, means so much more than just being a good person. The promise of a new creation is something that is completely brand new, not only to this world, but to us as well. Now, last week I spoke about peace. Uh, about, uh, but, but notice what I said about peace when we talked about it, that just like when you talked to, tried to give a definition of grace and you stopped it, it's just God's love, you forgot a peace that was really, really important to grace and that it is freely given by God. Peace was the same thing, you remember. We said, I told you that peace doesn't just stop at the true definition that says that it is the absence of conflict but that the peace that the Holy Spirit gives to us, this characteristic of a new creation of peace, is something that's inside. It allows us to take whatever this world throws at us and no longer be fearful of it. To roll with it and be okay with what's going on. To realize that behind us lies the greatest power ever known. To have peace that God has our back. Now what, that de- now what I told you last week is that it doesn't mean that we won't be set upon by this world, that this world and its ruler, which remember what I told you, the ruler of this world as it stands right now is Satan himself, not God. God created the world and he will rule it one day, but not right now. This world throws so many curveballs at us and hills and valleys and mountains and everything else. The peace that the Holy Spirit gives to us allows us to take all those things and realize that the power behind us is greater than the problem before us. Now this week, we go on to the next characteristic. And you'll notice that it builds upon the peace that we first received from the Holy Spirit. And I want you to keep in mind as we go through this series, but specifically as we go through today, what God promised us in a new creation is perfection. Not just merely good, but perfect. Now I say this knowing full well that the trait that I'm going to talk about today is probably one of the traits that is most missing from our world. It's probably most missing in all of us. Patience. I've, uh, I know I've alluded to it many times in many other sermons here and in other churches that we live in an age of instant gratification, which means that we don't have time for patience. If I'm sitting in a waiting room and I want to know the score of the Astros and the Texans and I want to see how my friend is doing and I want to entertain myself because God forbid I should be bored for a couple minutes, I have my iPhone sitting in my pocket and I can do all of those things pretty much simultaneously. And almost everyone out here can do the same thing. And so all of a sudden we start to realize that this trait of patience is not very regularly exercised in our world because we don't have to food can come in a split second we can contact anyone we want pretty much at any time as long as they're awake we can get news and updates from any source we want at merely a thought now 
this sermon could be a really quick sermon about how God wants us to be patient about his plan and, be, and wait for his timing because we all know that God does things in his own time and not necessarily in ours. But think back what I said last week about peace. If we stopped where we think we're supposed to stop, we miss part of the message. Patience is the same thing. This characteristic of patience isn't just for our relationship with God. It isn't just for us to sit there and say, okay, we're going to wait for God to do what he's going to do. You see, Christianity is something that is a lot more than just living with us and God. Christianity can't be done in a vacuum. Christianity must be lived in community. One of my uh, mentors and good friends um, always used to tell us something that we, all, you know, everyone is here has, has heard. Christianity focuses on the cross. But he said, but remember what the cross is. Not what it represents. We always want to remember what it represents, but what it is. A vertical piece and a horizontal piece. The vertical piece should represent for us the fact that we have to have a relationship with us and God, up and down. But the horizontal piece should teach us the, the, the next lesson that Jesus taught us as well. We should have a relationship with our neighbors. One without the other is just a stick. Both together is Christianity. We have to be living in community. We have to be living with our neighbors. So when I talk about patience, and if I only spoke about the patience of waiting for God's timing, I've missed half the point of the trait. This morning, we read a story that is widely known by pretty much everyone at this point. The prodigal son is one of the most prolific uh, parables that Jesus teach, stories that, te that, that Jesus gives, and almost everyone has heard at least probably three or four different sermons on it. It's a great piece. I love this particular story because it's, in my opinion, one of the most applicable parables that Jesus ever taught. Because the fact is, is that when we read this story, we can put ourselves into pretty much every single pair of shoes that we find in it. No matter where we are in our lives, how old we are, or what's going on, we can find ourselves in the story of the prodigal son. Sometimes we find ourselves in the, sto in the story as being the youngest son. The one who made the wrong choices, made the mistakes, and went off on his own because he thought he knew best, only to find out that he had made some serious mistakes and needed to repent and come back. Maybe we find ourselves in the place of the older son, and we didn't read that part of the passage, but we all know this, the end of the story where the older son gets mad and jealous of his younger brother who he looks down upon because he made all these mistakes. And the older brother says, wait, I didn't make any of these mistakes. Why is he the one that gets the celebration? And of course, we learned the valuable lesson that God will go forth and search out that lost sheep and will celebrate when he is returned. But how many times do we find ourselves in the older brother's position? Maybe, and sometimes we can even see ourselves as part of the servants of the household that are just celebrating with the family the return of their lost brother. We do that every time someone joins the church, don't we? We celebrate together. You may not have had a hand at all in the fact that they chose to come to Christ, but you're going to celebrate with them anyway. You're going to celebrate that they've made that choice to turn to God, to turn to Christ, and to become a Christian, and to start that journey with them. But in every sermon that I have ever heard, and, and, and most of the time I talk to Sunday school classes and everywhere else, I find that the one character that no one tries to put themselves in is the father. Because they tend to say, that's God's realm. That's, that's the God character of the story, which is true. 
God's the one that forgives. He embraces and he loves and he brings back into the fold his lost sheep. But remember what I said. When Jesus says that he will make in us a new creation, he expects us to be like him. That new creation is going to be a spitting image of him. Perfect. And so I want to focus on the father figure in the story. Because it's the father figure that teaches us what real spiritual patience looks like. We see this perfect kind of patience in the father because at the very end of the story, when Jesus is talking about how the young man has figured out his, way, his, his incorrect ways of living, his mistakes, and he's on his way back home, where do we find the father? The father isn't just doing his normal chores out in the field and not thinking too hard about anything. He is searching for his son. He is anticipating and anxiously waiting and watching for something amazing to happen. Notice what Jesus says about the father. Where does the father see the young boy? His youngest son. He sees him at a distance, a long ways off, and runs to greet him. Now, what this tells me is that the father wasn't just doing his chores around the farm, happened to look up at the gate and see his son standing there. But that his father was sitting on the porch, straining his eyes, looking for when his son would come home. Now, I think that it's safe to assume as well that the father probably started doing this the very evening that his son left. Straining his eyes, waiting with bated breath until his son would come home. This is the kind of patience that the Holy Spirit gives to us. It's the patience to wait for the great thing to happen. When I talk about patience being a key characteristic in this brand new creation, it means both a patience to wait upon the Lord, because of course, as I said, the Lord's time is not ours, and we have to wait sometimes for His things to happen, for His plan to unfold. And that goes back into the peace that we talked about last week, that we can have peace that we know that even though we have to sit and wait for the plan to unfold, the plan will unfold. And when it does, it will be perfect. And it will be glorious. But the patience also allows us to have patience with our neighbor. In the story, it was his son, but it's very easy for us to see this as a patience with our neighbors as well. Because what does Christ say? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. The neighbor means anyone and everyone, whether they're blood relatives or not. And so when the father is sitting there patiently waiting for his son to realize that he has made the mistake and is going to come home, he doesn't wait by just forgetting about it. He waits with anticipation. He waits with full knowledge that something great is going to happen, that his son will figure this out. It may take him a year or two years or however long it takes him, but he will figure this out and he will come back. He never gives up. He never thinks it's a lost cause. He is patient and waits. In the new creation, we have to have the peace that the persecutions that we will encounter in this world are nothing compared to the awesome power of the God that stands behind us. And we also then need to have the patience to wait. To wait for the most incredible miracle that God can work. 
This is what we wait on. And we wait with the full knowledge that it will happen. We may not know when. We may not know how it's going to take a form. But we know it will. And this is the kind of patience that the new creation is given. And it is given to us as soon as we allow the Holy Spirit to give it to us. But as you can tell, this patience is important. Because when we get impatient, that's when we start acting like the young son. I know what's best. I know how to spend this wisely. I know how to do this better. I know how to make the plan quicker. We wind ourselves up in the pig pen, needing to come back. But there's a lot of times we get to be the father too. But that mistake is done to us. And our job is to wait patiently so that when that young son comes home, we greet him on the road with open arms love and mercy and compassion. Did you notice there's no condemning here either? There's no question of what did you do with the money because the father probably didn't know everything. There's no question about what you've been up to or where you've been. It's the first thing he says. Fetch a robe. The best one. Clothe my son in it. Kill the fatted calf, we have a celebration. Put rings on his fingers. Put brand new sandals on his feet. Take care of him. That sounds like a father who had planned this out for a long time. This wasn't a spur of the moment thing. He's been sitting on that porch waiting for this moment to occur knowing that this moment will occur. This is the spiritual patience that we want to anticipate, to wait with our eyes wide open, waiting for that perfect moment, that amazing power. When we ask God to make us into the new creation, when we bring the Holy Spirit into us, This is the kind of patience that he promises. It's completely different from anything we've ever experienced. But it's what he's giving. And it's amazing when we're a part of it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, patience is a virtue that is dwindling in all of us. We don't practice it nearly as enough as we need to. We lose our patience more often than we keep it. But Father, you exemplify to us what real patience is. Patience with a purpose Not just sitting back, but waiting on that perfect moment. So, Father, we pray that you would give to us this kind of patience. Show us again and again and again what this patience looks like so that we might exemplify it ourselves. We might add it to our character. We might change bit by bit into the new creation that you are making. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.